Chapter 47, Pain. In this chapter, we'll talk about the neurons involved in normal somatic sensations. We'll discuss nociceptor pathways, including transduction, transmission, perception, and modulation of pain. We'll discuss altered pain sensitivity, as well as acute and chronic pain. We'll look at pain in the young and the elderly, treatments to pain, and then we'll end with phantom limb pain. So normal somatic sensations involve at least three orders of neurons. The first neuron would be the first neuron in the pathway, so that would be our peripheral neuron that sends the impulse into the spinal cord. Here it's coming in through the dorsal root, synapsing at the level of the spinal cord. The second neuron in the pathway will go up the same side of the spinal cord, uh, cross at the level of the medulla. So it will cross to the other side of the body in the pyramids of the medulla, and then we are going to send that impulse to the thalamus. So the first order neuron comes in from the periphery into the spinal cord. The second order neuron is within the spinal cord and transmit the message up to the brain. And then the third neuron in the pathway will then send <clears throat> the information within the brain to the correct area. So in this case, it will go to the correct area of the somatosensory cortex. Um, so this is how normal sensations are uh, detected and how it reaches the brain for us to perceive it. Association cortices allow us to relate the sensation to memories as well as other sensations and other things that may be going on at the time. Now let's talk about pain. So pain activates nociceptive pathways. And there are two pathways that I want you to be aware of. The first one is known as the reflexive protective response. The second is the ascending pathway. So in the reflexive protective response, it is a reflex, it is protective. So the uh, reflex is integrated in the spinal cord. So the brain is not involved in this reflex. An example is our withdrawal reflex. So when you touch something hot with your hand, your hand will automatically move away even before you might even detect that uh, intense pain. And so what's happening is the sensory information is going into the spinal cord and the spinal cord is directly activating the motor neurons to move your hand away. Even before we send that information up to the brain to perceive the pain and then to send the information back down to tell you to move. Because if we're waiting for all of that to happen, we're going to be burning our hand the entire time. Now, obviously, we'll eventually become aware of the pain, and that's because we will also activate ascending pathways, ascending meaning to go up. And so these neurons will send the information up to the primary somatosensory cortex, where we will then become conscious of the pain. We will sense the pain. And that way, we'll seek out you know, a remedy for the pain. We'll take care of the burn that we received. So pain is... Um, although it's unpleasant, it is actually protective. And so it's an important sensation to be able to sense. Um, it's associated with acute uh, tissue damage or even potential tissue damage. This is why pain is so important. It tells us there's something wrong so that we're going to seek treatment or seek relief before it becomes worse. And um, again, it's going to warn us of impending tissue injury. It involves several processes. And it's divided into our transduction phase, and then we have transmission of the pain signal, perception, and modulation. So transduction is where we actually are going to um, convert the uh, painful stimuli into activating our neurons. It activates the receptors and then activates our neurons. Then we're going to transmit the signal through our nervous system. So via action potentials, we're gonna transmit the signal. And notice it's going in through the dorsal root and here it's crossing to the other side of the spinal cord. So you cross at the level of the spinal cord, not at the pyramids with pain sensations. And then we're going to continue to transmit the information up to the brain and once it reaches the brain, that's when we perceive it. So this is when you actually feel the pain. And once we feel the pain, we actually will modulate the pain. So we'll actually send signals down to modulate the pain so that it's not as intense, although of course we still feel it. So let's go over each of these steps, starting with transduction. So this is the process of converting that painful stimuli, in this case a needle prick, um, into action potentials, APs or action potentials. So nociceptors uh, will produce noxious stimuli onto, uh, onto our nervous system so that we can activate these action potentials. So there are chemicals involved like potassium, hydrogen, lactate, histamine, serotonin, prostaglandins, and all of these are basically going to alter the membrane potential of our receptor so that we can activate an action potential. Now NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, prevents prostaglandins. And notice prostaglandins are one of the chemicals that helps um, 
transduce the pain. And so by preventing prostaglandins, um, it is a pain uh, reliever, or it decreases the pain sensation. And the prostaglandins um, will produce, um, or the NSAIDs will prevent the prostaglandins from being produced by inhibiting the action of an enzyme known as the Cox enzyme. So that's a mechanism of action. So once we've transduced the pain, uh, we've turned it into an action potential, that action potential is going to then be transmitted through our nervous system up to the brain. So um, we will transmit the information to the central nervous system by two types of primary sensory fibers. We have our large A delta fibers and our small C fibers. So these A delta fibers are large, meaning they're large in diameter, and these are also myelinated. So both of those, the large diameter and the myelination, means that these um, fibers or neurons are going to send action potentials very quickly. And so these A delta fibers help us feel what we call fast pain. So this is that highly localized, intense, sharp pain that you feel um, at the site of injury. So if someone were to accidentally hit you with a baseball, that right where you get hit, that sharp, intense pain that you feel, um, that's your A delta fibers. And then after that intense, sharp pain right at the site of injury, you get that lingering kind of diffuse pain that kind of radiates out. That's... Um, coming into the spinal cord through C fibers. So the C fibers are smaller in diameter and they're unmyelinated, which means they conduct action potential slower. And it produces that dull, aching, poorly localized, what we call slow pain. And most sensory afferent fibers will enter the spinal cord through the dorsal root, and it will travel to this area of the dorsal horn called the substantia gelatinosa. And then we will then cross, we'll synapse here, and then cross to the other side of the spinal cord, and then go up to the brain through the anterolateral tract. And specifically, we have two. We have the neospinal thalamic and the paleospinal thalamic. So the C fibers will go up through the paleospinal thalamic, and the A delta fibers will go up through the neospinal thalamic. <clears throat> and um, so a little bit more about the transmission. So here we go. We're in the dorsal horn. Uh, we've trans admitted the signal into the spinal cord, we're synapsing in the substantia gelatinosa. We are crossing to the other side of the spinal cord and going up the anterolateral tract. So a lot of chemicals are involved here, like the chemical substance P, glutamate, GABA, CCK. Um, so those are the chemicals that are released to activate the next neuron. So once you go up to the brain, we'll, go ahead, we'll head on over to the thalamus, and then again, we'll uh, send that information to the correct area of the cortex so that we can feel the pain. We'll even um, activate the limbic system so we have an emotional reaction to the pain. So let's take a look at the um, anterolateral tract. So again, um, the C fibers, our slow pain fibers, will go up the paleospinal thalamic, and the um, A delta fibers, our large fast pain fibers, will go up the neospinal thalamic in purple. And so if you take a look, the paleospinal thalamic, our slow pain fibers, will also go to the RAS, the reticular activating um, formation. So here we're going to be able to stimulate arousal and attention to the pain. And then um, the neospinal thalamic will go to the thalamus and then to the somatosensory cortex so that we can actually localize and identify the pain really perceive the pain. Now, um, this is a dermatomal map, and what this does is it shows us what level of the spinal cord um, neurons will enter into from different areas of the body. And in general, it kind of makes sense, meaning we know we have our cervical spinal cord, our thoracic, our lumbar, and sacral. And so if you stand with your arms kind of up to the side, that's near our neck region. And so all of this area, right, the arms, the upper body of our shoulder, all of these um, areas will have neurons going into the spinal cord through the cervical region. <clears throat> and then in the trunk area, which is where our thoracic vertebrae are located, that's where the um, neurons will enter into, from our T1 to our T12. And then in the lower extremities, we have the neurons entering through the lumbar and the sacral region. So you need to know this in general terms. For example, if you were walking and you step on a tack, it's most likely to activate your lower lumbar or your sacral regions as opposed to your cervical or thoracic. So understand the general. And, that's, and by the way, that's important to know the dermatomal map because um, that's how you figure out 
what level of injury someone may have in terms of their spinal cord. So where can they no longer feel gives you an indication of what level of injury you may have in the spinal cord. Now, if you've ever had back pain, you know that it's pretty hard to localize exactly where the pain is located. You can kind of know it's like in the lower back, but it's really hard to pinpoint the exact location. So why is that? Um, so it's because our brain makes priorities. And unfortunately, our back, in terms of sensation, is not high on that list. Over here, we have a homunculus. And so basically, a homunculus is body parts lying over um, the somatosensory cortex. And the area of the brain, the body part is above, indicates that that area of the brain is responsible for that for, for feeling from that part of the body. So right here, we would um, feel the hand. This area feels the arm, etc. And the first thing I want you to notice is that this man, he's broken up, but he is not... Um, uh, his body regions are not proportional. So his back, his trunk, is really small compared to his hand or even to his lips. And that's because certain areas of the body are more important for feeling. And so you're going to dedicate more of the brain to that region. So we feel with our hands. So our hands are pretty big. We don't feel with our back. That's why that back is so small. And that's why it's hard to lo localize exactly where your back pain is coming from. So let's review pain quickly. So with her right hand, April attempts to pick up an extremely hot cup of tea from the microwave. Um, please circle to indicate which uh, is correct. So at least how many orders of neurons form the pathway for burning pain? Would it be two or three? Remember, we always have at least three neurons. At which level of the spinal cord do first order neurons from April's hand enter her spinal cord? So we're talking about her hand. Is it likely to be coming in through cervical 6 to 8 or thoracic 6 to 8? So if you stand with your arms to the side, that's near your neck, so it's most likely cervical. And then April's second order neurons, do they or do they not cross to the left side of the spinal cord? Because we're talking about pain, pain fibers do cross to the other side. So they don't cross again at the medulla. They only cross that one time in the spinal cord. So a man was asleep on the couch when his teething baby daughter bit him on the ear. What parts of the pathway caused him to feel the pain? So to feel the pain, basically every part of the pathway. So the receptors, um, the pain fibers, the A delta to C fibers, uh, in the spinal cord, the anterolateral tract, the thalamus, the somatosensory cortex, everything was involved. So it's not all listed here, but everything was involved. What caused him to wake up? He was sleeping and he woke up. Well, the area of the brain responsible for arousal is your RAS, reticular activating system. And then what caused him to grab his ear as opposed to his arm? Like, how did he know the pain was in his ear? Well, that would be the job of our primary somatosensory cortex. So that allowed us to identify the precise location of the pain. Now, if you're sleeping and something bites you, you might be swinging, but he stops mid-swing. Why did he stop? Well, because he saw his daughter and he doesn't want to hit his daughter. And so he was able to use his association cortex to relate the pain to the baby's presence. So remember, the association cortex allows you to associate the pain, the sensation, to whatever is happening. In this case, he sees his baby. So he was able to infer that the baby probably bit him and he doesn't want to uh, hit his own child. And his blood pressure increased, his respiratory rate increased. What caused that? Well, it's kind of an emergency, it feels like, so he's going to turn on the GAS. So his hypothalamus activated the sympathetic nervous system, which increased heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate. So Joe trips and falls over something in the driveway. You're going to match the parts of Joe's brain with his function. Um, so which area of the brain pinpoints the specific location of the pain to his foot? So again, to identify the specific location, we're going to use our primary somatosensory cortex. What area of the brain ascribed meaning to the pain? For example, Joe realizes his son Timmy has left his bicycle out again. <clears throat> so that's an association. So it's an association cortex. And then which provides an emotional response to pain, such as anger and frusta frustration at little Timmy? And that would be our limbic. That's our emotion. So now that we have transduced the pain and then transmitted it up to the brain, let's talk more about perception. So again, we don't perceive pain until it reaches our somatosensory cortex. And the pain that we feel can be influenced by our awareness of the pain, our emotions associated with it, even previous experiences or expectations. So if you've 
for example, been to the dentist and had a bad experience, you know that the next time you go, the, doc the dentist may just squirt water in your mouth and you already feel like it hurts and you kind of uh, react to it. So that would be our previous experience and our expectation that really plays a role here. So here are some um, things related to pain. Uh, we have pain threshold, tolerance, and expression. So pain threshold is the level of pain stimulation that's required to be perceived as painful. So, um, you know, how much, for example, someone's pinching you, how much, how hard do they have to pinch before it actually is perceived as painful? So that's pain threshold. Pain tolerance is after it's something feels painful, how long are you willing to tolerate it or bear it before you seek relief? So some people have better pain tolerance than others. So it hurts and they recognize that it hurts, but they can deal with it. And then we have pain expression. This is how do you communicate when you are in pain? So some people scream, some people cry, some people stay silent. So everyone has their own way of expressing pain. So is pain a rare or common reason for people to seek professional help? It is absolutely common. This is usually the reason why people seek help. Uh, because something hurts. Now, which refers to the amount of pain a person is willing to endure before the person wants some relief? That would be pain tolerance. Which is more constant from person to person? That's pain threshold. Okay, so pain threshold tends to be more uh, consistent from person to person, not exactly, but how long you are able to deal with the pain, that pain tolerance will differ. Um, and some people uh, bear certain types of pain better than others. Now that we have perceived the pain, let's modulate it. So we're going to now send information down to the spinal cord to kind of relieve the pain a little bit. Uh, because remember, pain is important and we want to feel it. So we felt it, we'll seek help, so we don't want to feel it as intensely. We still will, but let's try to modulate it a little bit. So these are descending pathways from the brain to the spinal cord. And they'll release neurotransmitters that can inhibit the transmission of the pain signal. And we can see that happening here at the level of the spinal cord. So notice the pain signal came in, but now it's kind of uh, diminished as it, uh, because we're modulating here. So opiates like endorphins and morphine are mediators of presynaptic inhibition. So they basically raise our pain threshold and they produce sedation and even euphoria. That's why some people actually enjoy pain. Um, <clears throat> we have the Raffae Magnus, uh, sorry, the Raffae Magnus that receives um, input from the periaqueductal gray. And so the periaqueductal gray is your endogenous analgesic. It's kind of like your own little um, pain reliever. And so it helps in this process of trying to modulate the pain. Um, so the opiates have different effects. Uh, depending on the type of receptor. And there are four receptors. We have mu, kappa, sigma, delta, but only the first two, mu and kappa, have that analgesic activity. So ultra pain sensitivity, we have hyperpathia. So hyperpathia is when you have an exaggerated pain to a nociceptive stimuli. So the pain continues, for example, even after the pain stimuli is removed. So in this hyperpathia, something is supposed to be painful. It's a nociceptive stimuli, but the pain is exaggerated. Like it's even more painful and the pain lasts even more. So that would be hyperpathia. And these, all of these conditions can have, uh, can arise from different, um, you know, like diseases or different types of injury. Then we have paresthesia. This is where you have that spontaneous, unpleasant sensation, that feeling of pins and needles, or that tickling, prickling feeling that you get when your foot falls asleep. So that's the paresthesia. Then we have hyperalgesia. This is increased sensitivity to pain. So something shouldn't feel painful just quite yet, but you feel it is painful. And then we have allodynia. So this is pain after a non-noxious stimuli. So something should not feel painful at all, but to you, it feels painful. Um, this happens, for example, when, uh, like if you have carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, if you have carpal tunnel, uh, you, you know, touching your wrist area shouldn't hurt, but because you've already kind of injured the nerve there, um, just hit touching it or, you know, putting some pressure there uh, sends pain uh, signal. And then we have hypalgesia. This is reduced pain sensation. So something should feel painful, but you don't feel it as painful. And then analgesia is a complete absence of pain. So hypalgesia is a reduced pain sensation, so it doesn't feel as painful. Analgesia, you don't feel pain at all.
Okay, so these are just altered uh, pain sensitivities. So let's review it really quickly. Celia's foot fell asleep as her nerves were compressed by her cross legs. Now she feels pins and needles as her foot wakes up. That would be our paresthesia. Tony experiences increased sensitivity to pain. He's more sensitive to pain, so he has hyperalgesia. Joan has an exaggerated response to painful stimuli. Her pain feels explosive, so the pain feels bigger than it should. That's our hyperpathia. And then Elizabeth experiences intense pain that's initiated by light touch that really should not feel painful, and that would be our allodynia. So there are different types of pain. We have acute and chronic. So acute pain results from tissue injury, um, and it's generally resolved when the injury heals. So it's acute, it's short-lasting. It's accompanied by activation of the sympathetic, so our GAS. So we'll see our elevated heart rate, increased respiratory rate, increased blood pressure, increased circulating blood glucose, pallor, sweating, nausea, and decreased GI activity and bladder activity. Um, Short-term therapy, uh, you'll use non-opiates or even opiate medications to provide um, pain relief, and um, hopefully the pain doesn't last too long as the injury heals. Now, headaches are a common cause of acute pain. And um, the earlier the treatment, treatment is initiated, the better the outcome. Now, there are different types of headaches. Uh, we're going to go through it very quickly. We have migraines. Um, migraines result from dysfunction of brainstem areas that's involved in modulation of the craniovascular afferent fibers. Um, a lot of people suffer from migraines, and um, it can be pretty debilitating. So symptoms typically are unilateral, meaning on one side of the brain. It can feel pulsing or throbbing. It can last from a few hours, four hours, to up to several days, 72 hours. And it can be accompanied with things like nausea, vomiting, photophobia, and phonophobia, which is sensitivity to sound and to light, and um, as well as tears um, or having tears. And then there are certain triggers. Um, stress can be a trigger, certain foods, people have had certain foods be a trigger for their migraine, and then sleep deprivation is also a trigger. Uh, treatments, well, number one, identify your triggers and try to avoid them. Sometimes they're unavoidable. Um, so then we have serotonin receptor agonists, um, we have uh, ergot alkaloids, NSAIDs help, antidepressants have also been um, helpful, as well as beta blockers. Next we have cluster headaches. Cluster headaches are intense pain, and they tend to occur periodically in clusters. Um, so these actually can be quite intense and um, have also been known as suicide headaches, and it kind of gives you the indication of how intense, that they, how intense they are. Then we have tension-type headaches. These are diffuse, mild to moderate pain over your head, your scalp, your neck, and it's usually associated with tightening of your muscles. And then sinus headaches are deep, dull, throbbing pain in the front of the head um, caused by inflammation of your sinuses. Next, let's talk about chronic pain. So chronic pain uh, may be associated with a disease, or it could be pain that lasts longer than the expected healing time. And it's generally not associated with signs and symptoms of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, but being in pain, obviously, chronically uh, can be difficult. So depression can be um, a significant factor that's associated with chronic pain. Um, so you'll also see things like loss of appetite and sleep disturbances. So chronic pain, again, can be associated with a lot of diseases. So these are different conditions. So these are just some. It doesn't mean these are the only, you know, conditions that lead to chronic pain, but here are just some. And the first one is cancer-related pain. So we've talked about cancer, and we know that cancer can lead to pain. And so as you know, long as that cancer is in your body, it's obviously going to be painful, and it's going to be a while. So it's associated with that cancer disease process. Um, it could be in, re, a result of infiltration of the organs by the mass or compression of structures um, as the mass grows or even as a result of treatment for the cancer. Um, adequate pain control is a major factor that affects the quality of, quality of life. So you really want to um, help cancer patients deal with the pain. Another is fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia, the etiology is unknown, but um, there are some risk factors, like being female is a risk factor, having family history um, of fibromyalgia, as well as rheumatoid arthritis. And it's basically pain throughout your body. So it's widespread. Um, and it's chronic musculoskeletal pain that really affects all of your extremities. 
and it may be associated with um, sleep disturbances, um, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, irritable bowel syndrome. And treatments, try to restore your sleep pattern, try to get some regular exercise and alleviate the depression. And drugs that are on the market include Lyrica, and it's really used to try to target the pain pathways and to kind of calm them down. Then we have neuropathic pain. So this is pain that results from damaged nerves or dysfunctional nerves. So whenever you kind of damage a nerve, it tends to send shooting pain signals. So what could damage a nerve? I mean, pretty much anything. It could be excess pressure on the nerve or a physical injury, a chemical injury, an infection, or it could be ischemia or inflammation. Um, symptoms, you get constant aching pain. It could be intermittent, sharp. Um, it could feel shoot like it's shooting or burning. Um, and then allodynia is actually quite common with um, neuropathic pain. So remember, allodynia is the pain after a non-noxious stimuli. So when you have an injured nerve, even though you're not injuring the area of the body, just touching that area and activating that injured nerve can send pain signals. Um, treatment, antidepressants help, and anticonvulsants. So antidepressants really to... Um, deal with the depression that can be associated with it, and then the anticonvulsants because it's, it calms down nerves, including nerves that are injured. Then we have ischemic pain. So this is obviously pain related to, that results from ischemia, um, which is our interruption in blood flow. And so if our tissues aren't getting blood, they're going to start to um, get injured. Uh, so symptoms include aching, burning, or tingling pain. So to manage it, you want to try to restore blood flow and reduce the tissue hypoxia. Um, so chronic ischemic pain, we see it oftentimes associated with atherosclerosis because, again, that atherosclerotic plaque can block blood flow. So obviously treatments, if it's associated with atherosclerosis, you want to change your lifestyle, lose weight, stop smoking, exercise. Um, a surgical bypass surgery might be required, or you might have to put in a stent or, some, or you know, some other way of restoring blood flow. And then we also have referred pain. So referred pain is when you perceive pain in one area of the body um, that's not the actual site of injury. So for example, when you have a heart attack, you tend to feel pain in um, the jaw and the left arm, even though it's your heart that is being injured. Um, so a lot of the times, the area that you feel the pain um, is sort of somewhat associated with uh, the area that's actually injured inside your body, but not all. it's not always the case. So for example, we can see um, your pancreas is not located up here in your left shoulder, but with pancreatitis, you can feel pain up here in your left shoulder. Uh, same thing with cholecystitis. It's not up here in your right shoulder, but we might feel it here. But in general, um, you know, the area kind of makes sense. So for example, an appendicitis, you'll feel it here. Um, pain in the small intestines, you'll feel it here where it's kind of located or in the colon. Now, why do we have referred pain? So this figure here kind of explains it. So here we have a sensory neuron from the kidney and from the skin. Notice they both go into the spinal cord and they converge on the same second order neuron. And so when this neuron fires and sends the information up to the somatosensory cortex in the brain, it's going to associate it with our skin. And so when we have pain in the kidney, because it's still going to this area of the somatosensory cortex associated with the skin, we'll feel it here in the skin. So the reason is because these two neurons from these two areas converge onto the same second order neuron. Now, what about pain in the young and the elderly? So pain is actually frequently under-recognized and under-treated in both the young and the elderly. Uh, so think about it. Uh, babies cry, right? They cry when they're hungry. They cry when they soil the diaper. They cry, you know, just because. And so you might not notice that a baby is actually in pain because they're crying because they cry all the time. Um, and even in the elderly, it's under-recognized and under-treated because there's two kind of scenarios. We can have some scenarios where um, an elderly individual might say they are in pain when they really aren't in pain, like they're, you know, they're, they kind of might complain a lot, I guess. And then so you stop um, really giving them, um, you know, paying attention when they say they're in pain because they kind of say it all the time. And so they might really, really be in pain, but you don't really um, give them uh, that kind of immediate attention. Or it could be the other way, that uh, they don't want to feel like 
you know, they're a burden or they don't want to say that they're in pain and so they don't express it. So for both reasons, it can be under-recognized and as a result, if you don't recognize it, you can't treat it. Um, we also have um, inadequate pain treatments for babies because um, we have their babies. So um, you have to be really careful about the treatments that you provide for pain. And um, <coughs> including the fact that analgesics might um, have a you know, too big of an impact on infants or in the young. And so you have to be really careful because um, their body isn't completely developed yet. And um, same thing with uh, the elderly. Again, their organs are not working at optimal. So you just have to be really uh, careful with treatment. So what are the treatment modalities to pain? So there are three direct points um, in which we try to kind of deal with the pain. So number one is, try to interrupt the peripheral transmission of the pain signal. So often this is the first step in trying to control pain. So application of heat can alter blood flow and reduce swelling. NSAIDs, again, can decrease, decrease prostaglandins, um, but a side effect includes GI bleeding and decreased platelet aggregation and um, renal insufficiency. So you don't want to overuse it. And then using local anesthetic agents um, for the localized pain. Um, another kind of treatment modality is to try to modulate the pain transmission in the spinal cord. So now you've allowed the pain transmission to enter into the spinal cord. Now we want to do something in the spinal cord. So this is where cutaneous stimulation can play a role. So through cutaneous stimulation, you're going to activate and recruit sensory neurons that in the spinal cord can kind of block uh, the transmission of the pain signal. So essentially, you are, um, by activating the you know, your skin, you're going to activate sensory neurons that will go into the spinal cord in the same area and um, reduce the pain uh, sensation getting transmitted within the spinal cord. So transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation can help, massage, acupuncture, or acupuncture, I'm sorry, um, cryotherapy, which is cold, and then therapeutic touch. So all of these are um, trying to modulate the pain in the spinal cord. And then we have trying to alter the perception and integration of pain. So this is where opiates come in. So they work to um, try to um, uh, decrease the pain, the pain sensation um, because we have these opiates that are really highly concentrated. The receptors are highly concentrated in the brain. Now, one thing you have to be um, kind of careful about is tolerance and dependence. So tolerance is where you need increasing dosages to achieve the same analgesic, analgesic effect because your body has started to, to tolerate um, that opiate and so you need more and more. And then dependence is characterized by withdrawal symptoms if the treatment is stopped abruptly. So people can become dependent on it where they constantly need it. And then we have phantom limb pain. So phantom limb pain is what you see after um, an amputation. So not everyone experiences this. About 70% of amputees may experience it to some degree. So it can begin as a tingling sensation. Uh, the limb that is no longer there can feel hot or cold or heavy, and there can be burning or cramping or shooting pain. And it can actually disappear spontaneously or even last for years. So why does a limb that's no longer attached to your body feel like it's there, and why does it hurt? So there are a couple of theories. So one theory is that the end of the nerves that have been severed start to regenerate, and they regenerate into the scar tissue at the amputation site. And these nerve endings can become sensitive to like just you know stimuli, like either mechanical stimuli or sympathetic activity, or just circulating catecholamines and fire. And because again, these are injured nerves, when they fire, they send a pain signal up to the brain. Another theory is that our homunculus gets rewired, so our brain gets rewired. So if we're not using, let's say, an area of the brain because our hand was amputated, then this area of the somatosensory cortex really isn't getting utilized. And so our brain will start to rewire, and our nerves, let's say, from our neighboring areas will start to kind of creep in over here and fire um, and activate pain signal in the hand, even though the hand is no longer um, there. So these are just theories. So we don't quite know exactly what's happening, but um, we definitely know that um, amputees experience phantom limb pain. So we will end with um, a slide on the pain pathway. So you are going to put these uh, kind of words or phrases into this flowchart.
And if you pause it here and give it a shot, that would be great. And then we're going to go through it together. So you have a painful stimuli. It will activate your A-delta fibers. Remember, those are our fast pain fibers. Um, one of the synapses that are, or one of the chemicals that are required is glutamate to be released at the synapse. And that will stimulate our second order neurons in the spinal cord. And the second order neurons will send that impulse to the brain via the neospinal thalamic tract, because we're talking about our A delta fibers here. And then it'll go to the thalamus. And then the thalamus will send it to our primary somatosensory cortex. And that allows us to identify the precise location of the pain and the type of pain. And we can also activate our association cortex, which allows us to relate the pain to other stimuli. And that is it. Thank you.